settled in. And then second, our faith has to be seen or demonstrated in how we live, right? Because faith without works is dead, right? And so if we camp in the theological truth and just allow it to transform our mind but not transform our actions, we have a problem, right? Or if we're on this side and we're all about doing, 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 but we don't understand why we are to do what we are instructed in Scripture, we have a problem as well. So there has to be a blending together of what we are to be with what we are to do. And when those things are together, it's like two legs or two arms. We can move forward and we can be on mission as God works in us and through us. And so uh, chapter 4 is the start of the doing section. And we'll see that next week. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Okay? But this week we have to understand, well, what is that calling? And as you know, we're talking about life together, the body of Christ, what is the church. And last week, if you were here or you listened online, we talked about the church, that it is built by Jesus, right? It is built for Jesus and is built on Jesus. I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That hell itself will not prevail. Death itself will not overtake the church. And that God has given us keys to the kingdom to deliver the gospel that both affects heaven and on earth. The church is eternal. The church is glorious. The church is precious. And my hope is that during this series that our heart will be expanded, our mind will be broadened and sharpened, and that we would fall deeper in love what God is doing among us and through us and within us. And notice that I used plural works here, right? Each one of us is a member, a part of the greater church. And it is important as we read this passage today for each of us to see this language of us and we and these type of things. Now, in Scripture and even in the book of Ephesians, there's a number of metaphors that God uses to describe the church. One of them is God sees us as a family and adopts us into his family. The church is also a body, and you'll see that in Scripture. We'll also see, uh, as illustrated, the church is a building, and that God is building us together for a habitation of His Spirit. The church is also described as a bride or a partner, an intimate partner, walking and connecting with Christ. We're also seen as an army that works together. Now, in each one of these metaphors, connectiveness and unity and oneness is emphasized. Why? Well, because without it, all of these metaphors fall apart. Because without a family, we're an orphan, right? Without a body, we are dead. Without a building, we are a brick, and without a partner, we're alone. And without an army, we will be destroyed. So God highlights who we are, right? And then tells us and emphasizes on the importance of togetherness. So I want you to see this in Scripture. And then when we bounce over to Ephesians chapter 4, you'll see that theme saying this is how we are to live together. So during this week, here's some homework. I want you to read through Ephesians and take it slow. Read through it. Take your time. Read through chapter 1. Read through chapter 2. Read through chapter 3. Read through chapter 4 as we look at that and on into the book so we can be prepared and understand what God would say to us. 
So this morning, we're going to see the purpose of the church, okay? And you'll see these points. I'm going to give them to you right now. We're going to talk about them. We, the church, okay? We, the church, display God's grace. Don't you like that, right? We, the church, display God's grace. That'll be our first point. Second, we, the church, display God's wisdom. And thirdly, we, the church, display God's glory. And we're going to see these three things in our text for this morning. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 1. Right in the beginning, Paul gives an introduction, then dives in with verse 3. And that's where we're going to pick it up this morning. And again, look at the plural language used in this text. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 3. We, the church, display God's grace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. There's the grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved, in Him. We have a redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. We're going to pause there. This is some deep theological waters. They are significant. And in the church, we together display God's grace. The world sees the grace of God through the church. We are a people of grace. And notice from this passage all the things that God gives to us by His grace. Aren't you grateful for the grace of God? Incredible. Verse 3, if you can back up to that. Verse 3. I'm going to point out a few things. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God has not held back from us any spiritual blessing. Do you realize that the original lie that we read about in the book of Genesis, right from the beginning, right from the mouth of the serpent, Satan of old, was to try to tell us, to try to tell you that God is withholding something good from you. That is, in essence, what the serpent communicated to Eve and to Adam. God told you not to participate in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted to keep that from you because God is not good. He's withholding from you. The truth is from Scripture itself, that through Christ we have received every spiritual blessing. 
God has given you, God has given us everything you need for life and godliness. You have what it what you need because he has what it takes. Can you say amen? You have it. Heavenly, eternal, redemptive, restorative, recreating spirit of God and his promises and the fellowship of the saints and the foundation of his word and his spirit working in you. God has provided all of these things to us in His truth. And these things can only come from heaven. And these things are only found in Christ. And these things are displayed in our life and in the church. Verse 4 he, which is God, which is Christ, is the one that chooses or that chose us. And we were chosen, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Your life and your salvation. Even the time that you were living during this year was not a cosmic accident. We can say amen, right? That he knew of you and he provided in his glory and his grace salvation even before anything that was created would came to be. This is God's glory and his wisdom seen by his grace. And he chose us. God has a plan set in place. He has chosen you to be in His Son. God displays His grace by choosing us. Right? And sometimes I say it is scandalous that God chose to choose me to be a part of his family. You think about your own life. God extended an invitation to me, to you, to us. That is amazing extension of grace. And he did so because it pleased him to do so. He did not choose us because we were something or someone special. He chose us because he is someone special. And he wants us to know how good He is because of His grace. Aren't you grateful that our salvation is not dependent upon our goodness, but dependent upon His grace? Right? That's comforting. That helps us to be grateful to God for His grace. It helps us to worship God for His goodness. And it helps us to extend that grace to all people, to other sinners, just like us. God's grace. He chose us to be, verse 4, holy and blameless before Him. So the question is, how are we holy and blameless? Well, it's because of His Son. If we are in Him... And if He is in us, He redeems us for Himself. We take on Christ, and Christ takes on our sin, so that in Him we are the righteousness of God. 
When God sees us, he sees Christ. Because we're in him and he's in us. And then we walk, we'll get to this in a manner worthy, the pathway that Christ shows us, and he lives in us because of God's grace to us. We are holy and blameless because he is holy and blameless. Verse 5 and verse 6, we see that he predestined in us, preordained us to be adopted, and we have become his children through Jesus Christ. Now, I have not been an orphan, nor have I been a part of a system waiting to be adopted. Some of you in this place have been a part of I know people personally who have been adopted. What a huge gift it is to be chosen, like that word, to be a part of a family. And we're not talking a dysfunctional family. We're talking a glorious family with Christ as the head with an inheritance, and with provision, and with connection. God has preordained you and I to be adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. We are a part of the family of God with siblings who have been redeemed because of the Lord our God, displayed in the grace of God. Jesus Christ, as Scripture tells us, our older brother. He did this because of his glorious grace, and he has blessed us in the beloved. Ephesians, you'll read chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and these are important verses, for it's by grace you have been saved. How is this grace given through faith, right? And this salvation is not your own doing. It's not that you can earn salvation. It is a gift of God, not as results of works, so that no one may boast. No one's going to enter the kingdom of God and get to the gates. Hi, it's me, Dave. You have to let me in because I earned this. I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> As you should. All have sinned. Thank you. And fallen for God's glory of this perfection. Regardless of how good you are. And what do we do to meet that gap? We stand guilty before a glorious. In God's grace, He gives to us what He requires of us, makes us new, holy, and upright because of. Christ, the righteous one. In him, verse 7, the good word, we have redemption through his flesh, precious blood. And we have forgiveness of our trespasses through the riches of his grace. We're all here because of his grace. We have all things because of His grace. We have nothing that we've done to earn these things. We have them because He has chosen to give them to us. Therefore, none of us 
have anything to boast about, right? To help us in our humility. Paul records these words, I think they're great, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He wants us, and I want you to do this. Now consider your calling, brothers, sisters. Now, not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many of us are powerful. Not many of us are or were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the one. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, <laughs> even things that are not. Why? To bring to nothing things that are. So that no mere human might boast in the presence of God. Don't you like that? That's God's wisdom. That's God's prayer. He doesn't go out and look for the brightest and the shiniest and the most gifted. The people in which have a million and millions of hits on YouTube, billions in some cases, and Songs and cars and Corvettes and Corvettes, yes, that is a car. All of these things, these beauty and these nobility, God says, not that some of them aren't saved. I'm not saying that. But God says, you know what? The world thinks that's what should be chosen. I choose people in Rockford, Illinois. I choose people that the world will forget. I choose those people who have issues. I choose those people who are poorer. I choose those people who aren't that bright. So that I can display my grace and glory. Right? And we can say amen because I am duly qualified. Right? And so are you. We, the church, are all trophies of His grace. You look around this building... Your trophy. Your trophy. Your trophy. God's grace. We display His grace. We are a people of grace. We're not better than anyone else. We have just been redeemed. We are the reservoirs of His grace and in humility. We receive it, we display it, and we give this grace to others. This should help us to be humble people. This should help us to be thankful people. This should help us to be worshiping people. You understand that you're here by grace. It breeds humility in us. Right? Come on. It helps us to be thankful. And then to worship. I want you to understand what God is doing in this church, what He's doing in you. If this truth impacts your heart, it looks like humility. We'll see that next week. It looks like thankfulness God, thank you it looks like worship he will hold me fast Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and other things that we sing why do we sing them because it's true why do we sing them because he's Worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he is righteous and loving and gives us his grace. 
So the church, this is one of the things the church does. It's important theological truth. The church displays the grace of God. We see that right from the beginning. Second, this is our second point. We, the church, display God's wisdom. Verse 8. God gives us his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. What's he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What was he doing? To unite all things in Things both in heaven and things on earth. God's wisdom and his will, his plan for the fullness of time is to unite all things in him. God's wisdom is displayed in unity and connection. Do you know that our sin separated us from heaven? We can't access God's perfection. And there was a wall of dividing between us and God because of our willful disobedience to Him. God's plan and His wisdom to, to reunite, how do you like that, heaven with us. And also, because of our sin and sinful tendencies, we on this planet disconnect with those people. Those people of a different colored skin. Those people living in a different part of town. Those people who have a different political persuasion. Those people who are old and crotchety. Those people are y- that are young and reckless. Do we tend to divide ourselves on this planet? We make tribes all the time. God's wisdom not just unite us back with Him, but also to unite us together. The church is not just for white people. Amen, brother. The church is not just for Asians or for Africans, for those living in China or India or Yugoslavia or Russia or Pakistan or Iraq. Burma. It's for all people, every. God's wisdom is seen in his reconciliation with himself and his reconciliation with other people. And so we look to be connected in Christ that in this place, the local church, and in the church global that expands itself to every place on this planet, expands itself to the the past and expands itself into the future. We are united together in Christ, by Christ, for Christ. That's God's plan. And if you were a first century Christian, this was scandalous. Because you thought that the people of God were only those born of Abraham. And God in his wisdom wisdom expanded his family into all of the nations of the world, including both Jew and Gentile, which most of this room are that, to bring them together and unite us together. That's God's wisdom. And guess where his wisdom is displayed? 
and the church. This here is a microcosm, right? We have people of different skin colors. We have people of different languages. We have, different, we have people of different education levels. We have people of different locations. We have people that shouldn't be in the same place, sharing the same space, seeking the same thing, but we do. Why? Because it's God's wisdom. What unites us is stronger than what divides us. And my hope is when Rockford looks through this window and participates with us here, they'll say, how can this be? Where we are divided in various ways in this place, there's unity. Why? Because of God's grace, seen in God's wisdom to bind us all together. The church displays the wisdom of God through reconciliation with God and reconciliation with each other. That's why this is important to God. You, we, together display God's wisdom. That is one of the purposes of the church and God loves it. We display His grace being chosen, God, by us. We display his wisdom and our connectivity to God and one another. And thirdly, we, the church, display God's glory. Verse 11. In him, we collectively have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Let that sink into you. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Even things you and I cannot comprehend. Even things where we think is disastrous, God will work these things to conform his will. It gives us strength to persevere. Someone say amen right there, right? Even in difficulty, even in heartache, even in um, um, things that we have to endure. God works all things in accordance to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation... And believed in him, you and I were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is guaranteeing our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The church displays the grace of God. The church displays the wisdom of God. The church displays the glory of God. We, the church, display God's glory through our salvation and in our inheritance. We have been saved from the wrath of God for our sins to the atoning of the Son. We have been saved from the power and the penalty of our sin. And not only that, we've been given an internal inheritance through His Son. The inheritance is in eternal life, in new bodies, in the recreation of all things on the day when he makes all things new. God's glory is seen in part by his remaking of us. The greatest miracle of all is changing someone internally. Right? Which has an eternal impact. That God changes from running towards the things of the flesh and anger and lust or in greed or in whatever. Gives us a new heart. Gives us a new 
direction and changes us from being grumpy to being loving, to be impatient to being patient. Now, do we do it perfectly? No. But we're in process. And that's done by the Holy Spirit, by His grace through faith in what Christ has done. He deposits it into our heart. It's like a ticket saying, I'm giving you a little bit now, but hold on, friends. Yes. Yes. Come. I remember a story, and perhaps I've shared this before. This one lady, she loved the dessert. Desserts were her jam. She would skip her meal, go to dessert first. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good. And she made specific instructions that when she was buried, that they would bury her with a fork in her hand. Yeah, that's true. Because she's like, best is yet to come, and I'm going to get my dessert. Death will not destroy your life. He said, do not destroy your This life, you'll have troubles. And we can say, amen, brother. Right? You're here in pain today. This life, there will be trouble, but He has overcome the world. And even if you have trouble for your whole life, it's only for a lifetime. What's longer, 100,000 years or one year? Or 100 years? Even 100 years, right? You get a new body. Thank God, right? Even though you are good looking. <laughs> the glory of God is seen here in this change of our hearts. In the giving of our lives, and time and prayer and stuff and energy. The glory of God is seen in you. And it's just a taste of what is yet to come. For God makes all things new. No more sin nature. Thank God. Yeah. No more bodies that are not working the way they should. No more planet that struggles. No more separation. From those we love and like God love. So I want you to understand what God is doing through the church. This is our calling. Think about this, right? And you can read it. We, the church, display God's grace. Aren't you grateful for that? Thank you for your grace. Remember that today. We Display God's wisdom and our unity amongst our diversity. We display God's glory in the changing of lives and the mending of hearts and the hope that we have and what is yet to come. My heart is that we'd be thankful and cherish what God is doing through the church of Jesus Christ. Esteem her, cherish her, embrace her. Be committed to each other, committed to what God is doing. We are the church and the gates of hell will not prevail again. And you have an invitation even this day to receive God's grace.
Those of you who have done so, embrace what God is doing, understand. And next week, we're going to talk about what this looks like. What we are to do is important. But you have to understand these things. And an invitation is extended to you. Perhaps you have not received God's grace. You've been around Christ, but you haven't been in Him, right? You've known about Him, but you haven't trusted for your salvation. Today, you can put your hope in Christ today. I will pray for you. So let's bow our heads, open our hearts, we're going to pray, and then we're going to transition into communion. So God, thank you for your grace that's extended to us even this day. And we do pray for any person who is listening online, who is Various rooms are in this room that would extend themselves and say, I need this grace, I need this new life, I need this promise. God, forgive me of my sins, make me new. Fill me with your spirit. Change my life. You are Lord, and I will follow. God, I'm thankful for the people who have already and are making that commitment, and even again today. God, I ask that the truth of this passage would be deeply imprinted on our hearts. Open our eyes so that we can see more of your grace. Deepen our understanding to know your wisdom seen, your reconciliation and unifying work. God, may we experience more of your glory through salvation and in our inheritance. Thank you, God, for what you've given us in Christ and through Christ. In Jesus' name.